I'm not going to preach on Mark. I'm going to make reference to it. I'm actually looking at a piece of scripture from Hebrews, New Testament. But what uh, Adam has just preached, there's one verse there, verse 33. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbour as yourself, is more important, is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And it's those few words I'd like to talk about. Before I do, is anybody... Have we got any blood donors here? One, two, three, four. How many pints, Rob? Four so far. Four. How many pints? How many pints? Lots. Yeah, yeah. I'm a blood donor. It's, it is a sacrifice. I'll make no qualms about it. I don't like needles. So sticking them in your arm. That said, I'm up to a lot. And next go in February. But what uh, the passage uh, I'm preaching on is in Hebrews, and it's entitled The Blood of Christ. And uh, it may be up on the screen, it's just verse 14. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Well, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. And as a world, I think we've been saturated with words, books, thousands, if not millions, if not trillions. Take the Bible, for instance around 800,000 words in the Bible. But the Bible tells us in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So last week, for those that were here, Richard preached, and he uses, uh, used uh, Edvard Munch's uh, favourite, uh, uh, sorry, uh, famous painting, The Scream, for those that know it. And what Richard was saying, that that image, I don't know if those that know it's like a, a man just screaming out, emphasises our feelings of inadequacy when we ponder God's word, that sometimes we just don't, can't grasp it, find it hard to understand. As I've got older, I've become more appreciative of works of art, in particular paintings, and Pauline and I have been fortunate to view some paintings by some of the most celebrated artists in the world. Caravaggio, as we've seen in Rome, Michelangelo in Rome, Da Vinci. Um, they all bring a wealth of passion and intensity of their interpretation of words of scripture. And whenever I'm in Leeds, I try and visit the art gallery where the works of Stanley Spencer and William Holman Hunt carry on this tradition. And here's one painting on show that has a connection with what I'm about to say. It shows rabbis or teachers of the law shrouded in their prayer shawls. And for me it portrays not just the physical aspect of the group shuffling along for prayer, but it has a spiritual dimension of heaviness. Not so much with this image, but if you view the one in Leeds Art Gallery, it's a lot darker, and you get that sense of those rabbis burdened by a common source as they go along, something that's overwhelming them. The painting is called The Day of Atonement, and... Uh, it's by Jacob Kramer. There was an art school named after him in Leeds. I don't think it's such now. Kramer was a Jew. He was born uh, in Poland, but he was brought up in Leeds. When that painting was hung in Leeds Art Gallery, it was 1920, and it brought a storm of anti-Semitic uh, Semitic protests. 
which I understand was not uncommon in those days. Kramer died in 1962 and is buried in the Jewish synagogue uh, on Gelded Road in Leeds. But of course, the Day of Atonement is not just the title of the painting. The Day of, of Atonement is one of the holiest days in the Jewish year, in their calendar. In fact, I think it was last month in September. It's the day when Jews spend uh, fasting and praying and the Hebrew word you'll know is Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. And Jews today are following the traditions of their ancestors that are set out in the Old Testament. We always have to use, refer back to the Old Testament to get a fuller understanding of what we read in the New Testament. So we look back at the Old Testament to the second book, the book of Exodus, and this is when the Israelites came out of Egypt. The Israelites were persecuted. They were slaves in Egypt. And God brought them out through Moses. They arrived eventually in time at Mount Sinai. Moses went up Mount Sinai. He received the Ten Commandments from God. He came down the mountain, for those that have seen the film with Charlton Neston, two tablets under his arm, comes down. What greets him when he comes down? He goes out to the camp in the desert where all the Israelites are. By this time, they reckon, Rob, I think it said there were, there's something like 40 million of them. 40 million had gone for 40 years travelling round the desert looking for the promised land. Perhaps gone in a circle. So he comes back, goes to the camp, and what does he find? The Israelites, led by his brother Aaron, are worshipping a golden calf. They'd made a golden calf because they said to Aaron, well, your brother's gone. He's not going to come back. We need something here to worship. And that's what they worship, this golden calf. As a consequence of that, they were breaking God's commandment says you shall have no other god before me you shall not make for yourself an idol you shall not bow down to them or worship them they had sinned against god and that there you have the source of what those rabbis even today 21st century that's the burden that they're carrying the sins of their forefathers in that desert they're looking for atonement from God for what happened perhaps 3,000 years ago. Not 2,000, 3,000. They're burdened by the fact of sin. Sin offends God and causes a separation between us, humanity, and the one true living God. It's important to acknowledge that when we talk about sin... We're not talking so much about our own sinful lives, as potent as they are. After all, the Bible tells us we're all sinners. We're all sinners. We all, short, we all fall short of the glory of God. A friend of mine, when she learned I was involved with the church, she said, I, I went to a funeral the other week and the vicar said, we're all sinners. I'm not a sinner. I'm not a sinner. Yes, you are. We're all sinners. It's in inherent in us. It's just there. The American theologian Stanley Howos says this, there are some people who sinfully think sin is something we do rather than a power that actually possesses us. Sin is something that we do, like, oh, I'll take this. I won't mention it to anybody. And I'll do this. Nobody will see me. It's something that's within us. A power that possesses us. It's strong stuff, but it's true. So, so true that we need help to overcome the force that is within us. 
Let's go back to those rebellious Israelites dancing around the golden calf. God was not pleased with them and his anger burned against them for they were a stiff-necked people. So Moses said to the people, you've committed a great sin. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. And he went outside the camp to what they call the tent of the meeting. It was a tabernacle, like a movable church, for want of a better word, that they carried with them wherever they went, round the desert. The tent was split in two. The first part was for the lay people, the common people. The high priest went behind the curtain. You remember when Christ died on the cross? The curtain was torn in half. Christ had come into the world. Well, in that second part of the tent, he goes in there and he makes an annual sacrifice, the high priest does, for, of atonement for the sinful disobedience that those Israelites showed to God. He made an annual, uh, an annual but also an animal sacrifice. And in the verse 13 from, not the gospel reading from Hebrews, it says this, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so they are outwardly clean. Outwardly clean. And the key word in that passage is blood. Blood of animals sacrificed on the altar outside the tabernacle and sprinkled half on the people. This is what the high priest did. Killed the animals, got the blood, sprinkled it literally on the people, like at baptism, except it's water, sprinkled it on them. And then the other half would be put on the mercy seat of the uh, tabernacle, uh, sorry, the Ark of the Covenant that was in that separated piece of the tent on the top of it, i.e. that the people have got the blood, the blood is going with God to have mercy on those people. But we, we won't go into that too much at this time. But the reading really, uh, Hebrews, is the heart of the gospel message. And that, that message is the purpose of Christ's death, why he died, died on the cross. The banner headline over all humanity, both all those years ago and today, is this atonement for our sins. It's not just those Israelites coming out of Egypt, wandering around the desert for 40 years, worshipping golden idols and offering the blood sacrifices of goats and bulls as an atonement for their disobedience to God. But here today, for us, for the whole of humanity. The question I ask is this, why isn't Rob, our high priest, sacrificing goats and bulls and sheep? Even alpacas, we've got them in the churchyard. Don't answer that. There's two reasons why we're not, not, not making blood sacrifices in our altar today. And both are linked. The first reason goes back to the Old Testament times. Paul writing to the church in Rome said this. And this applies to us now. And we should be like this. We should not be, I am not ashamed of the gospel. We should all say that we are not ashamed of the gospel of preaching Jesus and him crucified. Because it is the power of God for the salvation, salvation, atonement for everyone who believes, first for the Jews in the Old Testament, and then for the Gentiles, us. So what's the connection between those Israelites following Moses out of Egypt and Christians today? Very simply, it's blood. There are numerous examples in the Old Testament of blood. Before those Israelites came out of Egypt, the blood of a lamb was sprinkled on the sides and top of door frames. This was when the Jews that I mentioned earlier, the Israelites came out of Egypt. What did God do? To release them out of Egypt, he sent the plagues, the ten plagues on the Egyptians. 
Then he slaughtered their firstborn. But what he said to the Jews was, sprinkle the blood of lambs on your doors, on the top of the doors, on the sides of the doors. He will see it. And he said I'll not allow, he would not allow any destroyer himself to enter your house. It was a sign the blood at that time was God's saving grace for those Israelites. So why are we not making blood sacrifices today? Second reason. Well, atonement, the forgiveness of our sins, is not at the moment when the sacrifice, the goat or whatever it is, sheds its blood, as distasteful as that may be, but when the blood, the blood of that animal is applied. So how, or, or should I say who, applies the blood? This is from the message. If animal blood were effective in cleaning up certain matters of our religion, so if Rob says, well, let's get a sheep, I'll sacrifice it on the altar and we'll use it there. If animal blood were effective in cleaning up certain matters of our religion and behaviour, our sin, think how much more, think how much more the blood of Christ cleans up our whole lives, both inside and out. And there we have it. The heart of our faith is the blood of Christ. The gospel message tells us that Christ died for our sins. Christ's death on the cross was the ultimate atonement for our sins. Atonement at one moment. At one moment. His death and resurrection applied to our forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Jesus is our high priest of the new covenant. There was the first covenant with the Israelites. Jesus is the new covenant that doesn't need animal sacrifices. Jesus himself is the sacrifice once for all. Now I mentioned uh, the painter, uh, William Holman Hunt. We used to have a member of the congregation many years ago whose name was Les Holman Hunt, just a thought. Um, it's called The Shadow of Death. It is a magnificent painting. This is in Leeds Art Gallery. If you get a chance, go and gaze at it. There we have Jesus as a human being working in Joseph's carpentry shop. It's the end of the day. He's done a hard day's work and he's stretching. His mum's there at the side of him. That painting is absolutely packed, packed with symbolism, scripture. The obvious one, of course, is the crucifixion, the shadow of death. You see Jesus' shadow there, and there above it, behind it, is the, the shape of the cross with the tools wrapped on it. Those tools could be interpreted as the tools that tortured Jesus when he was on the cross. Look at Jesus' head. See the blue sky, the halo, his divinity. Look at the star, the window above. The star of Bethlehem. See his mother opening a chest. And there in the chest, you can just see it. It's like a crown in that chest. Hunt said were the three kings' gifts when Jesus was born. On the windowsill, to the right there, you can see three pieces of, well, two pieces, hard to define, but they're pomegranates. Priests in the Old Testament, their garments on the bottom would have had pomegranates. It's a sign, it's a symbol of eternal life. 
full, full of symbolism. Excellent. If ever you get a chance, the red uh, like uh, thing at the bottom there, that was put on another painting of uh, Home and Hunt's called the scapegoat. That's where the word scapegoat, he painted, it's a goat that they used to put outside the camp. It's a scapegoat. That's another story. So I finish with these words of scripture. This is the, one of the most famous sayings from the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. I used to ask myself, why? Why did God sacrifice his son to give me eternal life? The answer is, as I said before, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If we say that we're without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not within us. But, and this is the but, in him, Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Amen. Amen. Amen.